I'm Rachel Zura. I uh, live here in San Francisco. I'm an attorney specializing in intellectual property, especially pharmaceutical and biotechnology, with a background in bioethics. You know, what are the ethical issues surrounding the use of uh, specifically HeLa cells in the case of Henrietta's story, mm -hmm. but also the, the issue of using tissues from people without their consent in general? The researchers who took the cells from Henrietta's, you've already covered, you know, they were attempting there were multiple attempts to find this immortal cell line and they were taking samples from anyone they could. She was there for therapeutic treatment when they took the cell line and at the time that the cells were harvested from Henrietta Lacks, the Nuremberg trials um, of the Nazi physicians who participated in medical uh, experiments, well, quasi-medical experiments in the concentration camps. The, one of the first principles to come out of the Nuremberg trials is that the voluntary consent of a human research subject is absolutely essential. Mm -hmm. And that's been embroidered on in United States law and ethical guidelines ever since. The informed consent that any individual participating in research needs to be told beforehand. They need to have all of the information that they are able to understand so that they can agree or not to participate in the research. It must be fully voluntary. It must be fully voluntary, fully informed and fully voluntary. You can't make a voluntary choice to participate if you don't have all of the information. Informed consent in the United States in the early 1950s was still a, a good theory. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone thought that this, this sounded like a great idea, but then you have an uneducated patient in the hospital who doesn't understand what treatment she's receiving, is not advocating for herself, and in the context of the time, in the context of the time most physicians would not have paused to think, I should explain to her why I'm taking this tissue sample and let her know what I'm going to do with it. Today, I mean, we can discuss some other examples. That sort of behavior still goes on, but it's uh, recognized by the medical establishment mm -hmm. to be an actual intrusion and invasion of the patient's autonomy, of the human research subject's autonomy. Right, now obviously things have changed since then. And, uh, incrementally. Know, in, okay, incrementally. Leaps then. and bounds, maybe not as much as we would have liked. <laughs> Well, I, I want you to speak to that for a second then. I mean, did the Henrietta Lacks story change anything, if not at the time, eventually? And if not that, were there other cases that you know, had a bigger impact on how we look at informed consent? Well, the Henrietta Lacks story, you know, I mean, wasn't known for more than 40 years. So when The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks was released, when Rebecca Skloot started publicizing this story, then I think the story has now become part of a really interesting movement towards control over personal genetic information, which I think we're really just seeing the beginnings of. Because legally, there was never a recognized right of ownership or control of your, well, in the past, tissues, blood sample, Etc. before genetic information could be extracted and used from those samples. Mm -hmm. But now, you know, Henrietta Lacks, you mentioned that her descendants are now sitting on a committee to authorize the use of the genetic information gleaned from the HeLa cells. Likewise, there was a really interesting decision in uh, 2010 regarding a small Indian tribe that lives in the Grand Canyon who had given blood samples to a University of Arizona researcher for it to be used in diabetes and schizophrenia research. Uh, one of the members of the tribe found out several years after these blood samples were donated that they were being used for purposes that the tribe members had not consented to. Mm -hmm. The University of Arizona, of course, argued that this was perfectly acceptable, they had the samples, they had no right of ownership to the samples. However, the ultimate outcome of this case is that the tribe was able to dictate that they would not authorize their blood samples to be used for anything other than the original intended purpose and actually all of the samples that they donated were destroyed. Mm -hmm. 
So, I mean, these are just a couple of isolated examples, case by case situations, not really setting the precedent for how we're going to be managing mm -hmm. genetic information that, are, that is in the hands of researchers. But it's indicative of an interesting movement towards people becoming aware of and taking measures to control the use of their genetic information.